Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Balancing Act. I'm Olga Villaverde. And I'm Montel Williams. Today, we're exploring novel approaches to better understand and treat cancers. Over the past 10 years, scientific research has allowed us to uncover many of the root causes of cancer with the hope to improve treatment options offered to patients. However, managing the emotional, physical, and psychological effects of a diagnosis can be overwhelming. So today we're going to hear from key players in the oncology field who are working to improve outcomes for patients. Absolutely. Take a look at this. I got the results the day before Thanksgiving. It was Wednesday. I was at work and they delivered the bad news that I had stage four gastric adenocarcinoma. I'm a retired veterinarian. I did mixed animal practice for a little over 20 years, and then the last 13 years I did just small animal practice, which is dogs and cats. And that was pretty much my, my passion, um, luckily, because it's a lot of work. Um, I had to retire between COVID and cancer and the job, it, you know, unfortunately. My other passions were hiking for a while, and more recently, my dogs and doing dog sports with them. I went through a hockey phase where I learned how to play hockey as an adult woman, <laughs> which was really entertaining, but I've made some of my very, very best friends in life through hockey, and in fact, that's how I met my husband. David and I have been together for about 20 years. He has two kids, I have one kid, and we have four grandkids. My symptoms started about seven and a half years ago with terrible, terrible heartburn. And so I, of course, proceeded to take a bunch of antacids and lived with that for a while. And then the antacids helped, except then over the next year or two, my asthma was very acting up uncontrolled. And so my doctor suggested I try antacids for that, which helped in retrospect that was a little bit of a symptom that I should have paid more attention to. So in 2019, I started having sharp pains in my abdomen. As they progressed, I had decided it was gallbladder attack. A CT scan found gastric wall thickening, which prompted a biopsy to be ordered and a diagnosis to be made. Well, telling my husband was fairly easy because I had been sharing stuff with him all along and I had a pretty good inkling of what this was before the doctor called. Telling my daughter was a lot harder and I must confess to this day, I never let on how serious it is. Well, at the start of this decade, an estimated 1.8 million new cases of cancer were diagnosed in the United States and over 600,000 Oh, these people died. That's so sad. The Balancing Act is on location at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, to meet with oncologist Dr. Jason Luke to understand more about the traditional treatments of cancer and what's on the horizon. So when we think about treatment of cancer over many decades, at first principles, we usually try to remove the cancer with surgery. And we sometimes try to consolidate that initial treatment using radiation, again, to try to limit the cancer in the location where it developed. When we think about trying to keep cancer from spreading or managing cancer after it has already spread, there we start to think about systemic treatments such as chemotherapies. So when we think about the changes in cancer treatment over the past, say, 15 to 20 years, what we've really seen is a movement towards the concept of precision medicine. We historically gave chemotherapy to the kind of cancer based on where it arose in the body. But as we've learned more and science has advanced, we've recognized that in fact, our treatments are better if they are tailored to the specific genomic changes in the cancer cells and that's less important, therefore, from where the cancer started. More recently, we've developed the tools to be able to profile each patient's tumor DNA, and that can sometimes give us a sense of which treatments might be specific for that kind of cancer due to the mutations in the cancer. And we sometimes refer to this as targeted therapy. So profiling the cancer on a genomic level then becomes a really important part of our treatment strategy. So as a physician trying to develop an optimal treatment pl uh, plan for each patient, 
One thing that can be very helpful is next generation sequencing, which gives us the ability to look for abnormal genes in a patient's cancer, but many at the same time. So whereas historically we would test for one or two, now we have a panel of mutations that we know are very common in cancer and for which we often will have drugs. And so performing next generation sequencing can allow us to test for all of those things at once so we can identify all the potential treatment options in a personalized fashion for the patient in front of us. As soon as I received my diagnosis, I immediately went for a second opinion to a big specialty cancer center, and they completely agreed with my local hospital's treatment plan, which consisted of no surgery, no radiation, due to the fact that my cancer had already spread too far throughout my abdomen. I started my treatment with standard of care. While I was on the oral chemo for a year, the cancer did spread to my ovaries. I had those removed, but I started looking more seriously at clinical trials at that point. I then found a clinical trial. After six to eight months of this clinical trial, the cancer started to progress further, at which point we agreed mutually that this was no longer beneficial. So I ended that trial. I have always been very determined not to give up ever at all. So I kept searching and searching for yet another clinical trial. I leave no stone unturned ever. Well, welcome back. Look, Endeavor Biomedicines is a clinical stage biotechnology company targeting the core drivers of terminal disease, including oncology and fibrosis. That's right, and here to tell us more is co-founder and CEO, John Hood. Welcome, John. Thank you, thanks for having me. You know, earlier, uh, Dr. Luke discussed the advancements that have been made with next generation sequencing. So what I want to ask you is, how is Endeavor Biomedicines harnessing this technology? Dr. Luke was spot on. Yeah. In the last five years, advances in next generation sequencing has really given us an opportunity to dramatically improve the treatment of cancer. We're no longer necessarily going after where the tissue starts. Who cares if it's breast, prostate, or lung? Ultimately, it's what's causing it. And that's what you get out of genetic sequencing. You understand the mutation that actually causes it, which creates an opportunity to block that mutation. By blocking cancer at its root, at its core cause, you can have dramatic benefit. You really can change effectiveness and safety for the patient. So Endeavor, we're looking at one specific protein, PTCH or patch, which is present in a number of cancers. And Evan, what have you learned about this patch one mutation? So the patch one mutation, it activates a intracellular regulatory pathway called the hedgehog signaling pathway. And it's known to be present in a big subset of skin cancers. And it's also known to be present in a subset of medulloblastoma and brain cancer. What we found at Endeavor is it's actually present in roughly 2% of all cancers outside of those two. So this is 35 to 40,000 patients a year who have this activating mutation that's known to cause cancer. And more than that, we actually know that the drug we're developing works in the previously discovered skin cancers, and it should also work, you would think, in the other cancers as well. And that's what we're evaluating. And once you evaluate that, where do you go from there? What does that tell you? So if it works there, then we can work with the FDA to get this approved. Mm -hmm. So patients who have no available therapy but have the patch one mutation, can take this drug. So for example, our clinical study is single arm. If you're a patient that based on genomic sequencing, and if you're a patient, every cancer patient should do genomic sequencing to understand what's causing their cancer, then you can be referred to our trial if you have the patch one mutation. Can you tell us a little bit about ENV101 that I was reading here? That's our drug. That is the inhibitor of the hedgehog pathway that we're using to treat these patients with patch one mutations. So this is a drug that's been in 200 subjects already. We understand its effectiveness and its safety very, very well. So patients enrolling in our study that have the patch one mutations, we know that they're getting a dose that will be active, it blocks the pathway, and it's safe. They don't have to be concerned about coming in at too low a dose or a dose that won't actually help them. This actually will block the pathway. We're also using an additional trial for a fibrotic disease called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is nearly as deadly as most cancers, and this pathway is heavily implicated there as well. Montel had mentioned clinical trials. Do you have any on the horizon? We do. We actually are just starting clinical trials now for um, oncology. The way the sequence works 
is if a patient has NGS, they're referred to our clinical trials and we're opening centers across the United States for that oncology trial. For the IPF studies, we actually have an international study that's already enrolling patients as well. This is really fascinating information. Please stay right there because we've got much more to come. When we come back, more with Endeavor Biomedicines. Stay with us. We're here with Endeavor Biomedicine's founder and CEO, Mr. John Hood, who's sharing some really phenomenal information. Thank you, sir, for being here. John, let's talk about what motivates you to continue to fight for this community, and, and especially your employees, and inspiring them to do the same thing. When you're helping cancer patients live longer and feel better, you don't need extrinsic motivation. It's inherent. Realistically, we've all been touched by cancer, and when you're touched, it's intimate, it's devastating, and you can't help but want to do better. For me, my mother and brother both died of lung cancer uh, over a decade ago when the therapies were not effective and they were very toxic. So sorry. We have to do better. That, and that's, that's the end of the day. That's why we're in this industry, develop therapeutics that can help save lives. And I don't have to be a cheerleader for my team to get them to do that. That's what they get up every morning wanting to do. I mean, we get it really clearly. I mean, your, your personal connection to cancer with your mother and your brother, but you've also had some other patients that you've treated in the past that you stay in touch with, right? That's exactly true. Um, the previous company I was at, I developed a precision med for medicine for a disease called myelofibrosis. It's caused by a mutation in a protein called JAK2, Janus kinase 2. Mm. So we had a very selective and active molecule for that that was very effective, and it's now approved in both the United States and Europe. Some of the patients that went on it have reached out and have formed relationships with. There's one young lady in San Diego that I have a very close relationship with because when she first started on this drug, she was only a little over 30, and she was going through complete bone marrow failure. She was having to have transfusions once to twice a month for red blood cells and platelets, and her prognosis was not very long. She got on the therapy and it worked. It worked exactly like a precision med should. It changed her life. And less than a year later, she's in Costa Rica on a honeymoon. Oh, with, wow. Yeah, yeah she's yeah. zip lining, rock yeah. climbing. She's doing wonderful. Oh my gosh. Tell us a little bit about your partnership with X-Cures. X-Cures is amazing. They are a matchmaker for patients to therapies. Uh, you can almost think of them as a Sherpa for cancer patients and oncologists. They take clinical and genetic information on the individual patient and using machine learning, identify the best possible therapy for them. If it's a clinical trial, they find the closest site to them to make it most convenient. So they've been very useful for us. They're, they're able to scan information on potential patients and put them into our trials. You inspire so much hope. And like you said, all of us have been touched by someone who has either passed or is enduring now that cancer fight. Any final thoughts? I mean, you're just such a special human being. Oh, thank you. Um, if you're a patient, be your own advocate. Make sure you get genomic sequencing. Find out the cause of your cancer so you can get the best possible therapy. It, you have to do it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us today the way you have. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Absolutely. You. Let's go back to Dr. Luke at UPMC to understand more about clinical trials. So when we think about clinical trials, it's important to point out that they're really the backbone of how we move forward to advance the field in biomedical research and treatment for patients in general. Clinical trials are highly regulated research experiments, but for which the doctor and the patient have jointly agreed that this is the best available approach in the context of what would be standard and the details of a clinical trial. I had pursued next generation sequencing from day one. The hospital started it, but I did additional sequencing, looking for actionable targets. I did go back on standard of care IV chemo while looking for my next clinical trial. There are tens of thousands of clinical trials and it's almost impossible to wade through them all on your own. So X-Cures is a very helpful company in the search for clinical trials. They take all your medical records, they review the standard of care, they review the next generation sequencing, and they compile a report of all the possible targets that will match up with a current clinical trial. In my sequencing, it turned out that I have many genetic mutations, including the most promising one called the PATCH1 mutation.
When someone's initially diagnosed with cancer, it obviously can be overwhelming, and they rely upon their physician and their treatment team to assign them the appropriate treatment. I really would empower people diagnosed with cancer to fully explore all the options that are available, and that can be discussing potential diagnostic testing of the tumor with next generation sequencing to confirm whether or not some mutations might be present or not, and whether or not other treatments might be available based on that. It's important to bring family members or caregivers who can also help to retain the information, and also to look for resources that can be trusted in terms of looking things up later so you can educate yourself about the expectations. And what I'd say to an individual facing cancer, and you wanna have that open dialogue with no barriers so you can make sure you eventually understand your treatment the best of your ability. So we're in a very exciting time in cancer research and cancer medicine because we're more and more able to identify specific genes to target with new drugs that may be able to increase the benefit of our treatments and decrease the side effects historically associated with chemotherapy. As a physician involved in biomedical research and cancer drug development, what really keeps me at it each day is that ability to take care of an individual person but bring in the science of what we're developing. It's perhaps the most rewarding thing that one can do. Look at alternative treatments, but do not forego standard of care. Look at clinical trials, get second opinions, get third opinions. I've had at least eight. Have someone help you navigate to search for clinical trials. I was completely unaware that there are multiple free trial matching services for any cancer patient. Xcures has been phenomenal. They really stepped up to offer a lot of different treatment options that I never would have found on my own in spite of a lot of research. And I believe very, very strongly in trying to participate in clinical trials for two reasons. One is selfish. One of these trials might actually give me a lot more time. And the other is a little more altruistic. No matter what happens, but in the end, this is totally going to help someone else down the road. They're testing new drugs and new treatments all the time, which is critical in gastric cancer, as we just don't have any good treatments currently. Another word about your family or your caregivers, I truly believe this is as hard or harder on them than it is on the patient. They feel completely helpless. They watch you go through this and even when the patient is putting on a really brave face for the world, the caregiver gets to see the real deal. So they have a pretty tough journey, and I just want to point that out in appreciation for family and caregivers. A lot of it sounds extremely cliche, but so true. Um, number one is be grateful for every day and for your family and your friends and your support network. Well, I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us today. Such great information. Yeah. And to learn more about the work Endeavor Biomedicines is doing and to participate in their clinical trials, visit EndeavorBiomedicines.com and ClinicalTrials.gov. And of course, you can always visit our website, TheBalancingAct.com. See you next time.